first of all, thank you for, for coming to this, this keynote, this trade keynote. We're going to be talking about what an independent UK trade policy actually looks like, and I'm going to be joined after I have outlined uh, our um, potential UK independent trade policy by Sir Lockwood Smith, who, as many of you know, for many years was the New Zealand High Commissioner here in London. But many, many of you may not know that Sir Lockwood was the Trade Minister in New Zealand um, at the time of the launch of the, tra of the, the, the building block of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which was the New Zealand-Singapore Agreement. And one of the things that um, Sir Lockwood uh, did as a sort of trade strategy vision was to look at what um, was missing in the international trade world and to try to do an agreement with Singapore on a bilateral basis that ultimately became uh, the TPP. So um, we're particularly delighted to have him here today. What I would like to do is just outline um, what are the key pillars of an independent UK trade policy? What does that look like? In our sessions on trade earlier on this morning, uh, we, you know, we, we keep coming back to the same question, which is, what, is the UK, what does the UK want to be? Uh, you, you can't actually have a, a, a trade policy unless you know who you are and you know what you want to be. Um, because your trade policy flows from that, um, that fundamental choice, that fundamental decision. And we are going to have an opportunity over the next two years as we negotiate with the European Union, but as we also talk to, um, to other countries uh, around the world to figure out what it is, who, who we actually are. Um, so that is the sort of fundamental decision that needs to be made. Now, what does an independent trade policy look like that we think delivers um, a successful Brexit outcome? Because I think we're all here today because we are all vested into uh, delivering a successful Brexit outcome um, wherever we have been you know, prior to the referendum. So we, we have prepared a blueprint for UK trade policy that you can um, find uh, outside. And essentially what the blueprint does is it, it talks about what, what is the best, uh, best case going forward. And when I say going forward, I mean not just in the next two years, but in the next five to 10, the next 20 to 50 years. What, what would be a really good outcome for the UK? And then let's figure out, having identified what the outcome is, then let's figure out how we get there, how we get from here to there. So what does that outcome look like? Well, basically, that outcome looks like a, um, a four-pillared trade strategy, which essentially has um, the first pillar is what we can do unilaterally as a country. Uh, this is often forgotten in trade policy, that actually there's a lot you can do unilaterally um, to improve your, your, your own internal arrangements and your own trading arrangements. Um, what can we do bilaterally? Uh, this is obviously the agreement with the EU is top of this list. Um, now, it is very unlikely, obviously, that uh, in the course of the two years after Article 50 is triggered that we will have a comprehensive uh, free trade agreement um, that, such as the one that David Davis earlier on uh, suggested. Uh, so we will have to have some form of interim measures on the way to that comprehensive free trade agreement. Um, the Trump administration has announced that um, the US would like to have a free trade agreement with the UK, and uh, having just been in the US um, for, for three days presenting on a potential US-UK free trade agreement, I can tell you that, that this is real, that the, uh, both the US administration and the US Congress are absolutely committed to a, uh, a trade deal with the UK, which is to our advantage. Um, then there are the agreements that we have through the EU with 40 or so countries, of which there are about six or seven that are very, very important for the UK. So what do we do about those? And then there are agreements that we might have with other countries that we don't yet have a trading relationship, a, a trade policy relationship. We have a trading relationship, but not a trade agreement with. So these are countries like Australia and New Zealand and, and so forth. And then what do we do about the developing countries, the ACP, African, Caribbean, Pacific countries that we, we in the UK have strong relationships with? Uh, that's the bilateral Pillar. Then you have the plurilateral pillar. What can we do in terms of gathering groups of countries on a plurilateral basis for high standards agreements, which are based on um, our 
our comparative advantage. So what is our comparative advantage? 80% of our economy is services. The, the big barriers in services are domestic regulation behind the border barriers. Those are the things that prevent UK services from, being, from having both market access and also being competitive in, in, in the countries around the world. So what can we do to gather a like-minded group of countries to deepen liberalisation, to move towards freer trade and freer markets, not just at home, but abroad as well? Um, is there a role for the UK in developing that pillar? And the fourth pillar is uh, what we can do multilaterally. And I'll talk a bit more about those pillars in a, in a, in a second, but before I put a bit more detail on, on the bones of what those pillars are, um, in order to do that, there are certain preconditions that we need to have secured in, in, with respect to our relationship with the European Union as we leave it. The reason we've outlined in the paper and, and in my comments this four-pillared strategy is essentially to show that the EU piece of that four-pillared strategy is but one part of one pillar and that these four pillars mutually reinforce. They are not only a mutual reinforcement mechanism, they are also a hedge against the one thing that we can't really control, which is uh, European cooperation. Um, David Davis outlined the, the need for a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with Europe. Um, we would assume that the Europeans will also want a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with us, but we don't control that. And so um, you need, in trade policy terms, to have a hedge against those things that you can't control. Um, the hedge also makes it more likely that the agreement with the EU will be a smoother uh, uh, agreement. So in order to deliver that, that four-pillared strategy, and again, I'll talk a little bit about more detail on that in a second. What are the fundamental conditions um, that we need to secure in order to develop that, to have an independent trade policy? Well, obviously, the first one um, is in this future relationship with the EU, we cannot be in the customs union. We cannot be in the customs union because then we can't have an independent trade policy. Um, and, and those pillars that I described all fall away. And the economic gains under those pillars, which are significant, all fall away. And you're constrained even on the unilateral things that you can do. So we can't be in the customs union. But what does that mean for the UK and the EU? It means that there are, coming out of the customs union, there are certain trade disruptions that we need to minimize. And the way to minimize those trade disruptions as we come out of the customs union is to look at ideas like, on an interim basis, a zero-for-zero zero tariff deal, which is fully WTO compliant, as long as it's in contemplation of a free trade agreement and for a fixed period of time. Um, look at things like mutual recognition, mutual recognition agreements on standards, uh, so that trade can flow more easily. The Euro Europeans have many mutual recognition agreements with many countries, and there's no reason why the UK should not be one of them, particularly as we will have ported over all European regulation, and so technically we will be uh, identical in terms of the product regulation and standards. Um, the third piece of that minimizing disruption area is customs clearance. We must ensure good customs clearance mechanisms between us. But there are many countries around the world, the US, Canada being probably the preeminent one, where about a, million and a, uh, a billion and a half uh, dollars of global of trade flow across the US-Canada border um, uh, every day. Uh, that is not a customs union, that is a free trade agreement, and it has extremely good um, customs clearance mechanisms, which many of which we actually already have, but many of which we can seek to improve in terms of our own customs uh, uh, agency. Um, and we're doing this anyway. I mean, we are, we are moving towards a better customs clearance mechanism, which will be ready by January 2019, notwithstanding what you might have read somewhere. Um, and, and so customs clearance is an incredibly important part of that. Ensuring that we have pro-competitive rules of origin between us and the EU is another important piece of this. And that's going to be a negotiation with them. But those are the things, and the question for us is, are any of those things impossible to do? And we don't think any of those things are impossible to do. Um, and in fact, we think all of those things on an interim basis are things that the European Union uh, would actually want uh, as much, if not more, uh, than, than we would. European corporates, European interests. Um, so that's your first sort of 
uh, set of conditions. The second set of conditions is you can't be in the European economic area, the single market. Why can you not be in the single market? You can't be in the single market because of the nature of our economy. Because we are a heavily services-based economy, a services negotiation is a domestic regulatory negotiation. Countries will want to negotiate. They want to know that you can put your domestic regulation on the table in order to negotiate with you. If you can't, they won't be interested in negotiating with you and we won't get any of the gains that come from that four-pillared trade policy approach. So coming out of the EEA means there's disruption, obviously. We just had a session on financial services. Um, what can you do to minimize disruption coming out of the single market? And is any of that impossible? Um, well, we, again, don't think that it is. Um, we have a, a proposal, uh, a, a document that we've uh, released on a dual regulatory coordination mechanism for financial services, which is essentially uh, home state supervision recognition. You heard this morning uh, a number of proposals on how um, financial services can be handled uh, coming out of the EEA. And again, we don't think that this is, this is impossible. And, and in fact, in trade terms, financial services, there's a huge opportunity here because in 1997, we were supposed to move from the WTO basic telecoms agreement to financial services. We were supposed to be looking at conditions of competition to ensure that financial services providers had both market access and market contestability uh, in the world. 20 years have gone by, nothing has happened. So there's a real opportunity here to get back to um, a financial services regulatory system that also is driving towards consumer welfare, is driving towards pro-competitive regulation, is not solely about a regulatory system around um, prudential um, uh, standards, important though those are. There are other concerns in financial services. And then we have aviation, we have a number of other uh, digital uh, single market issues where you need to solve the problems of coming out of the EEA, none of which uh, are impossible, and again, many, most of which, all of which, are, are, are issues that the European Union has a huge vested interest in. Those two areas have largely been resolved as a result of the Article 50 process. So this is why it's very important that as the Article 50 process has gone forward, both the European Union and the UK are aligned on the need for a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. Uh, a lot of work has gone into that process. I mean, we could have been in a very messy situation now where we were sort of wanting to be in the EA, but we didn't like their rules and we wanted to change their rules. We're not in that situation. We are in a clear situation. Um, uh, and those two issues have been resolved, and we will have to figure out how we can minimize these disruptions uh, as we go forward. The third area is actually far more difficult and far more important than any of these other areas, which is what are our domestic settings in trade terms going to be? And that is the question of who we are going to be as a country. Are we going to be an open country? Are we going to be a free trade oriented country? Are we, go are we going to be a free market oriented country? Those, the answers to those questions define what you can do and define how much of this four pillared strategy you can actually put into practice. Um, and those, we, we're going to have tough discussions um, on things like agriculture, on things like immigration, on things like industrial strategy. Um, but they are they are discussions against a background for the UK of historic op commitment to open trade, historic commitment to open markets and, and free markets. So um, I am very confident that as we go forward, our domestic settings will be open and we will be able to deliver on this four-pillared approach. But I would say one thing, which is if we are not able to deliver on what we've outlined in, in, this, uh, in this paper, um, these four pillars of, of trade policy, we are not going to have a good result here. And I, I want to underscore that. Um, it is vital that we are able to move forward on all of these pillars uh, at the same time. Um, and that is a good thing for, for the UK, and it's a good thing for the world, because very rarely do you have a country that is emerging on the trade policy stage. We basically have a new chess player that is a new chess piece that is being you know, dropped onto the trade policy chessboard. It is very rare for the ultimate result, which is a successful Brexit, a, a, a growing uh, economy that is lifting people out of poverty, that is generating and creating wealth, 
that is going to constrain our domestic settings. Normally, it's your domestic settings that constrain what you can do. Um, but the, the need to have a successful result, and they're really, in our view, and we've looked at this in every way imaginable, um, there is only one pathway to a successful result, and we're going, I'm just going to outline that and then ask Sir Lockwood to respond to it and give his thoughts on New Zealand's uh, approach, um, which is to have those open domestic settings not be in the customs union, not be in the EA, develop interim measures on the way to a full and comprehensive trade agreement with the EU that minimise disruption uh, as much as, uh, as it is possible for us to minimise disruption, and then to embark on the following agenda, or at the same time to embark on the following agenda, which is unilaterally, what can we do to reduce tariffs and quotas on goods agri and agriculture that we, particularly agriculture that we don't produce? Um, there are a lot of products that we don't produce, uh, that we don't produce products that are directly competitive or substitutable. Um, there's no reason why we should maintain very high tariffs, which, um, which are maintained now, on those products. Industrial goods tariffs that are nuisance tariffs of 4% or under, we can eliminate those, as Canada did, eliminated all its tariffs on intermediate goods so that its manufacturing sector is more competitive. Other countries have done this. This is not the UK charting an entirely new course. We're going to port over European law uh, into our regulatory system, um, but that is a soft baseline. That, that's not a, a, a set of regulations that we particularly want to have. We're doing it for technical reasons. And so being able to move from that to a pro-competitive regulatory environment in the UK to integrate um, mechanisms to ensure that when we regulate, we do so in ways that are as least trade restrictive as possible and, and as least market disruptive as possible, because that is how you create wealth. This is a very important point. Because one of the dangers we face as we go forward with our European negotiation is that we will be locked in to arrangements that aren't pro-competitive. And if that is the case, we won't be able to then negotiate agreements with other countries. Um, and then all the benefits that I'm about to outline fall away. And then bilaterally, I outlined all the possible agreements that we could have. Um, uh, th that's a very important process. Um, but it's a process, again, that helps us. We talked earlier on in our session today about negotiating simultaneously with the EU, the US, and, and also now having an EU-US negotiation as well going on uh, at the same time, while we are also simultaneously looking at things like the Pacific Alliance and we're looking at the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the, and the P4, other major agreements around the world. Um, we have a tremendous opportunity here. Um, Mexico, when, um, when it joined the NAFTA, the, the NAFTA was a powerful reform document for Mexico. It, it enabled Mexico to lock in better regulatory settings. Um, and we are going to be in a position where we will have that constellation of agreements around us and we will be able, if we are smart, we will be able to, um, to use that to ensure that we end up with a, a, a situation where we have um, not locked into European settings, but not diverged so far that we can't do mutual recognition agreements with them, but left the door open to, to flexibility so we can not only do deals with other countries, but you know, what's the reason for doing a deal with another country? It's not, you don't do a trade deal so you can have a piece of paper that says you've done a trade deal. You do the deal so that you can improve overall consumer welfare. You can create wealth, you can grow the economy, you can eliminate the barriers to trade. Um, that you face with the other country and with yourself. Um, that is the sort of bilateral pillar. And then we've talked plurilaterally about a prosperity zone, um, a group of higher standards, a group of like-minded countries that can embrace the high standards agreements that the, the, the world trading system, quite frankly, have, has, has not been able to embrace for over 20 years. Uh, we've had stasis in the world trading system for 20 years. This is the opportunity for Britain to exercise trade leadership. And frankly, I will tell you from traveling around the world and being in Geneva and other places, trade leadership, it, it's not that the rest of the world wants Britain to lead. The rest of the world expects Britain to lead. Why wouldn't you lead as the fifth biggest economy in the world, one of the largest global services exporters in the world, one of the largest sites of foreign investment and one of the largest foreign investors in the world? It would be odd if such a country didn't uh, lead. And that's the expectation, quite frankly, from the rest of the world. And then multilaterally through the WTO process that we're going through, which is a necessary rectification, 
But it doesn't stop there. Um, we can also be a voice in the WTO for greater liberalization. Again, why are we doing this? So that the barriers to trade that have been erected over the last uh, period can be reduced. And the new barriers to trade, which are behind the border barriers, regulatory distortions, all these things that are very difficult to, to deal with and relate to the structural uh, impediments in, in economies and are holding back global economic growth can actually be dealt with. What is the dividend from that process? We think the dividend from that process is, is very high. Um, if the uh, group of like-minded countries alone reduces distortions by about 30% over the next 15 years, and we're talking about Australia and New Zealand, Singapore, the UK, the NAFTA countries, Switzerland, then you are looking at an injection of anything between 1% and 2.5% into gross world product year on year for 15 years. These are not small numbers. These are transformative numbers. And they will be massively beneficial to the UK economy, but they can only be built this, this, this way. Um, and we have a narrow window uh, of time here because not only may we might get locked in as we go forward with Europe into European standards and regulatory uh, systems which then prevent us from negotiating with other countries, um, but the world will be waiting as well. And the world will wait for so long. Um, this is very important to our transitional measures or our interim measures. Uh, other countries will be prepared to wait for two or three years for the UK to fully be ready to negotiate a trade agreement. They will not wait for five years. Uh, they have other fish to fry. They have other agreements that they need to focus on. Uh, the world of trade moves at a, at, 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 at a pace. And if you are not ready to take the invitation, then it will, it will pass you by. So this is a very important factor that we have to consider when we look at our, our, our interim measures. But the short of it is that I think we are at a um, historic moment. We, we really are at an inflection point where the decisions that we make today will define not only Britain, but they will define the world uh, over the next 30 to 50 years. Um, and we have a huge, huge opportunity. Uh, and our, 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 when, and I'm very, sure that uh, at, at some point in the future when the history of this time is, is, is written, people will ask whether we actually stepped up to the plate, whether we did the tough things that we have to do over the next two years in order to deliver that economic in agenda that will be good for Britain and good for the world. And, you know, frankly, if we are unable to take advantage of this opportunity, I don't think it's going to present itself again, at least not for a very long time. Um, so on that note, um, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Sir Lockwood to, to reflect on the, 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 the strategy I've proposed and to talk about the New Zealand uh, experience. Thank you. Schenker, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm not sure uh, whether there's another session coming in here right now, Jonathan, but uh, uh, strictly there's only about six minutes left. But uh, uh, I apologise if I go over a little bit. Hey, look, you might ask, ladies and gentlemen, why is the New Zealand experience relevant at all? Well, actually, 44 years ago, Britain joined the EEC. At the time, over half New Zealand's dairy exports came to your country. In fact, a third of all our exports came here. We faced a challenge not dissimilar to, to Brexit. We were able to negotiate some quotas for, for sheep meat and dairy and beef, but beyond that, High tariffs meant that we're really locked out of this market in terms of future growth. And what's more, we couldn't get into the other high value markets of the world. The uh, United States and Japan, tariffs there ranged between 100 and 300 percent. So we had to find a new way of engaging with the world. And we really made some dumb decisions, some real dumb decisions. We thought you had to protect emerging industries. And, and so we, got, we ended up in a, a, a vicious cycle of, of tariffs and import licensing. And of course, that put up the cost structure of our economy. And other sectors of the economy wanted subsidies to, to make up for that, that, uh, that uh, raised cost structure. And within a decade, we had done huge damage to the New Zealand economy. We had reduced our responsiveness to the marketplace. It led to misallocation of resources. We had limited the uptake of science and technology. Of course, that constrained innovation, and we had hampered our productivity growth. After 10 years, 
By the early 1980s, the economy, New Zealand economy, was going down the plug hole. We were so dislocated from the marketplace, we started turning frozen sheep meat into fertilizer, thousands of tons of it, and we had a wine lake in New Zealand. In 1985, a new government simply eliminated those subsidies and started opening up our economy to the international marketplace. They also implemented some wider economic reforms that you heard Shankar refer to to make sure we minimized impediments to our competitiveness. And then over the decade of the 90s, when I was trade minister, we actually backed up those reforms with a global trade strategy based on the four pillars that Shank has just described to you. What did we learn from this? First, that unilateral pillar that Shankar referred to. It's a really important place to start. Shankar described it as sorting out what, what, you know, what, how you see your place in the world. It's important because you have control over your own economy. You don't have to wait for other countries to agree with what you're doing. You can actually get on with it and it delivers a powerful impact because it lays the foundation for your trade agreements with other countries. And what's more, perhaps even most important, it demonstrates leadership. In this day and age, big countries can't twist little countries' arms anymore. You've got to achieve influence through leadership. Now, some fear that opening up to competition leads to a race to the bottom. You know, you hear so many people say that, oh, it'll drive down wages, drive down regulatory standards. You, know, you hear all that sort of stuff. It's not been our experience. I mentioned a moment ago that in the 1980s we had a wine lake in New Zealand. Our wine industry was protected by a 40% tariff. You couldn't import cheap wine, so we produced it. It was battery acid. You couldn't export the stuff, no self-respecting person would drink it. In 1985, that tariff was wiped. 40% tariff just wiped in one year. 32 years later, Wine is our third biggest export to Australia, which is our biggest trading partner, not a bad wine producer themselves. Our second biggest export to the entire EU. We command the highest average price on the UK market here for wine, and now wine earns New Zealand twice as much as our wool exports. Twice as much as our wool exports, all through getting rid of that protectionism. Now, some might say, oh, yeah, that's just the wine industry. But take, take one of the bigger industries, New Zealand sheep industry. It was once so protected that under the OECD producer subsidy equivalent system, the subsidies got up to 90%. Those subsidies were wiped that same year in 1985. The subsidies were just wiped. Today, we produce a similar weight of lamb from less than half the number of sheep. It requires 23% less land, 19% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. From those years ago turning thousands of tons of sheep meat into fertilizer, 33 years later, a lamb carcass is now cut into 42 different cuts plus byproducts and marketed across 100 different countries around the world, and the productivity has improved 107%. That's the value of unilateral liberalization. That's what you can do to help yourself by opening up an economy. Now, the bilateral pillar that, uh, that Chanka mentioned before we, is critically important. We started with our nearest neighbour, Australia, in a bilateral trade agreement, just as the UK must start with the EU. Wisely, our free trade agreement with Australia was not a customs union. That was hugely important because it meant we could pursue our own global trade strategy. And in 1997, we were the first country in the world to sign China up to the World Trade Organization. In 2008, I was the minister who did it. I had to sing with the Chinese trade minister after I'd done it. In 2008, we were the first um, developed country in the world to negotiate a free trade agreement with China. And today, we're the only country in the world to have a free trade agreement with China, a separate FTA with Hong Kong, and a separate FTA with Chinese Taipei. Now, we also have, of course, FTAs with Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Korea, uh, and along with Australia with the whole of ASEAN. But in our experience, what's fascinating about these trade agreements is our treasuries all do analysis prior to the agreements of the benefits you're likely to achieve. Our experience is that the benefits from trade agreements far exceed pre-agreement analysis. In our agreement with China, for example, our treasuries analysis projected this amount of benefit. The benefits haven't exceeded that just by 100% since that agreement was signed in 2008, the benefits have exceeded our Treasury's pre-agreement analysis 11-fold, 11-fold. 
My one thing, though, I'd say to you, I mean, before I go into the What's critical about these bilateral trade agreements, it's not just about opening markets, it's about opening the minds of your business community. It's that power to open the minds to see what's possible out there. But the one thing is this, they must be high quality. It is easy to do quick, nasty bilateral trade agreements. There'll be plenty of people knocking at the UK's door wanting to do a trade agreement with you. They're easy to do. You'll regret them for years and years and years if they're not high quality. Let me come to the, 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 the most important pillar of all, the multilateral uh, pillar at the World Trade, Trade Organization. This is so important because it delivers the greatest benefits to the global economy. It facilitates global value chains. And let me just share with what that means. For example, in New Zealand, uh, an important industry for us is the dairy industry. But we only produce 3% of the world's milk yet we control over a third of all international trade in dairy products. But because we only produce 3% of the world's milk, we can't grow our economy just using our own milk, so we use other people's product and add value to it. We've got investments in the Netherlands, because they make a lot of cheese there, so we export, we've got a joint venture there, we export a byproduct from cheese manufacture here to the UK, lactose. Here in the UK, in a joint venture with Dairy Crest, we convert that into galacto-oligosaccharide, which is a very important ingredient in high-quality infant milk formula. We take from Dairy Crest some of the byproduct of their cheese production. We don't produce a lot of cheese in New Zealand. We take a lot of the, the byproduct from their cheese production, a demineralized way. We ship all that down to New Zealand and incorporate it into high quality infant milk formula, ship it on to China and with our joint ventures in China, market that across China. A true global value chain where we add value around the world using other people's products. And that's what multilateral trade agreements can facilitate. We could invest far more in that kind of thing if only there was liberalised trade opportunity here. We're stuck because we can't, because the tariffs are so darn high, you can't bring ingredients into this country. So the, that, the um, multilateral pillar is so important, and it's going to be important for the UK as you register your schedule of discussion this morning at the WTO. That's really, really important. In the interest of time, I'll uh, skip what I was going to say about, some of what I was going to say about the WTO, but some of it's getting, been getting bad press recently. <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, what I was going to say is this. At the WTO, you're negotiating with 164 members. But as you heard this morning, there's a smaller group that is important. They make decisions by consensus, but any one of those members can cause trouble. And that's why as you seek to register your schedule, it is actually a critically important process. And the WTO is, is hugely important still. Things like the sanitary and phytosanitary agreement that facilitates global trade in, in food products, hugely important. The dispute settlement system, hugely important for global trade because you can take your friends to the WTO to sort out a dispute. New Zealand's taken Australia, we've taken the UK, we've taken the EU to the WTO and Canada to the WTO. We've won every case we've taken to the WTO. <laughs> But we're still mates, we're still friends with the countries, and that's what's so special about it, that the system works. As someone said this morning, uh, one of the team, your team said this morning at the session, Shankar, it is, it, is, it is global law, it is international law that works there, and it's what's so special about the WTO. Let me finally come to the most important thing about this, though, is all the work you do under the other three pillars, the unilateral pillar, you know, the, the bilateral pillar, must be building blocks towards the WTO. And the most important building block of all is probably the plurilateral pillar. And let me just say a couple of words about that. For geopolitical reasons, we tried to bring in the late 90s an agreement involving the Americas trying to link them through Australasia into East Asia. United States, Chile, New Zealand, Australia, and Singapore. I worked on it for some years. It failed. We couldn't get it off the ground. So when I couldn't get off the ground, I thought, how do we make progress on this thing? And I remember I talked about leadership before. So I initiated a little bilateral negotiation with Singapore. The direct trade benefits were almost nil. The whole idea was to develop a new, uh, new model free trade agreement that could be an open accession platform that others could join. First, Chile and Brunei joined it, it became P4, and then in the ongoing evolution of TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the United States, Australia, Malaysia, Vietnam, China, Canada, sorry, not China, Japan, Canada, Mexico, and Peru, all came on board more than a third of global trade. Interestingly, that little negotiation with Singapore involved less than half of global GDP. Once Chile and Brunei joined, it became 1% of GDP. TPP, the evolution of TPP bought 40% of global GDP together. That's the power 
of the plurilateral open accession platform to really make a difference to global trade. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am going to miss some of this stuff. Let me, let me just make a couple of comments in conclusion. You know, trade strategies mustn't be fixed in concrete. You've got to keep uh, reviewing them to make sure that they are compatible with where the world has got to today. We've just renewed our 20-year trade, global trade strategy in New Zealand just this last few months. We want to engage more of our people on trade. We want to build and retain public trust and confidence because that's lacking on trade liberalisation. We want people to understand how well open markets have served us as a country. So our new strategies, looking beyond just opening up markets, we want to ensure business is able to take advantage of these market openings. We want to focus on, as you've heard people talk about, non-tariff barriers beyond the border. Uh, we want to get 90% of our exports covered by trade agreements and we want a greater uh, focus on services and investment and the digital economy. It's fair to say this though, that global trade has been in trouble since the global financial crisis. For the first time in three decades, growth in trade is slower than growth in global GDP. And technical barriers to trade have been growing not just in far-flung parts of the world, in the G20, technical barriers to trade have trebled since the global financial crisis. And I've got to say, current US uh, trade policy ain't helping either. What I want to say to you is this, though. You British people, I don't think, see your country the way we see it from the outside. You are the fifth biggest economy in the world. You have a heritage of open trade. Now, as New Zealand's trade minister, I was heavily involved in the battle for Seattle, where we tried to launch the Doha Round, I chaired one of the main working groups there. And I'll never forget how much I missed your voice. You know, the EU people there were so backward leaning. Everything was a problem. And I missed your voice hugely. Both our nations know that liberal economic policy has the power to raise people out of poverty and foster freedom. You know, if a, a smart global trade strategy helped take New Zealand from a protected, bankrupt economy 30 odd years ago, to one, a nation today on Legatum Institute's Prosperity Index, number one in the world. The greatest prize from Brexit is your ability to develop a global trade strategy. Britain's potential to play a, a leading role globally on trade liberalisation. The world needs you right now. Whatever you do, don't waste this moment. Thanks very much. <laughs>